back in February, I made a video covering as many throwback FPS games as I could muster. One of those was called Dread Templar, and it looked very promising. Well, it's now August, and it's in early access, so let's take a closer look. I'd like to thank publishers 1C Entertainment for sponsoring this video about what should be a fun, fast-paced and thoroughly quake-drenched FPS, purchasable entirely through the link in the video description. 1C have brought us excellent titles like Wrath, Aeon of Ruin, Viscerafest and Graven, so this should fit right in. The concept here is simple. You are this guy. Gunny McAngerface, also known as Dread Templar, seeking revenge deep in the evil realm. An evil realm that really does echo back to the glory days of Quake in so many ways. Low polygon enemies that look like they've just stepped out of a feverish nightmare. Winding level design with frequent keycard collection or light puzzle solving. A range of satisfyingly explosive weapons, varying in their projectile speed and intensity. Various medical packs and collectible weapons. A thumping dark metal soundtrack. On first impressions, you could almost mistake the whole environment for Quake. And this is meant in the best way possible, because anything that feels like Quake appeals to me on a deep and fundamental level. But scratch the surface, and there's a lot more to this game than a simple throwback rehash. System specs for this Unity-based game are completely respectable, as you'd expect. Windows 7, 2.5GHz CPU, 4GB of RAM, and an NVIDIA GTX 560. Therefore, my 10700K i7 and RTX 3070 should cut through it like liquefied ghee. We begin, as you'd hope, at the title screen. It has all the usual options. Yes, all good. You're then taken through a brief training exercise, which informs us about the cooldown features. First is your throwable katana. Next is the ability to do a dash, which helps navigate large voids and the like. And also we have buffet type, sweet! Oh man, I love buffets! So much selection, so much choice! Can't believe they've got this as a game mode! Oh, it's bullet time. This is a Matrix-like ability, which slows everything down, allowing for precise targeting. These three elements are nice to have. Bullet time needs recharging through collection of these energy cells or by blowing away demons. The longer your bar, the more time you'll have in slow motion. The throwable katana is useful and very powerful, especially if you're playing in harder game modes where ammo is scarce and the dash is essential for navigating certain level elements. But nothing beats the satisfying blast of dual-wielding handguns, or shotguns, or any of the other incredibly satisfying weapons. Honestly, this is a make-or-break detail for me when it comes to FPS games. Weak weapons just don't cut it. You need something that you can feel rattle through your soul, something dramatic and visceral, and thankfully all the weapons throughout the game have those exact characteristics. Saving is through means of these shimmering, spinny things. Walk up, choose a save slot, done. The game will autosave as you progress, but it only does this for the current session. If you exit and reload, you'll be reverted to your last manual save point. I've always preferred the control that manual saves give you anyway, to be honest. What adds more depth to this experience, though, is the person and weapon upgrades. You need to collect blood clots to unlock upgrade paths, and then collect tokens which can fit into these slots to give you more health, a stronger set of pistols, quicker dash recharge, and everything in between. It's like a little RPG side quest which really compels you to seek out as many side routes and hidden rooms as possible, and trust me, they are everywhere. 
you'll often face multiple paths, locked cages, suspect looking walls, which vary in their difficulty to navigate or unlock. But despite this, you'll hardly ever find yourself lost, which is a huge pet peeve of mine in these sorts of games. In Dread Templar, I kind of always instinctively knew where I was supposed to be going. And that's not saying it's simple and plainly laid out, you know, there are winding paths and tricky bits to work out, but it was fun rather than frustrating. And there's lots of things to look at on the way. This torture area is especially nice. I'm sure I've seen this kind of thing in someone's basement before, but it's not like that's the only theme you've got running throughout this game. There are huge vats of boiling death liquid, rooms filled with bodies in cages, massive spike pits, yeah okay, it's kind of the main theme, but think back to the original Quake, everything was quite brown, but then you'd get metallic hints in some places or areas that felt more mystical and new. That's the exact feeling you get from Dread Templar. There are long swathes of consistency, parts which give the game a tangible feeling of depth and involvement. You actually feel like you're in some kind of medieval torture chamber with a pair of Uzis, but then you'll advance to a new area which feels like the old area but very different, an evolution. But what's key is there are large outside areas as well as cramped tunnels and winding paths. This really gives you a sense of these worlds and helps them to feel alive. It also provides completely different landscapes and therefore tactics for fighting. Fast strafing in a tight room filled with enemies is very different from teetering on a narrow external pathway surrounded by flying demons. The abilities of these different foes and their placement also adds a sense of immediate panic to many situations. If you're in a tight corner, you don't want one of these huge lumbering chaps to lug a grenade at you. That's not going to turn out well for anyone. Equally though, you don't want one of these monk guys to launch a tormenting skull in your direction, especially one that follows you. What soon becomes obvious is that the old school strafing is of utmost importance in these landscapes, and you'll frequently feel yourself falling back to the circling whilst firing tactics of days gone by. Although how effective that is depends largely on how quickly your enemy's projectiles move, but that's probably what this game captures the best. The actual feeling of an old school Doom clone, before we'd even coined the term FPS. You'll find yourself frequently having to backtrack and seek out medical packs you've left behind before you wander into a big fight you'll find yourself jumping over precarious drops to get hold of ammo, supplies and upgrades which you're bound to need. And you'll cause and find ludicrous jibs scattered all over the place in the aftermath of a fight. You'll also find your shotgun absolutely essential. Well, I did anyway. The other weapons are impressive, and as you advance, you'll find them improving significantly. The gun featured in the artwork you don't get until chapter 2, but you soon realise why it's the showcase weapon. Weapons like the rocket launcher have slow moving projectiles, but can pack a good punch when targeted well, although it can't be used for rocket jumping. This freezing device is great for destroying little critters, and stalling bigger ones, allowing you to concentrate more significant fire at the flick of a mouse wheel. The bow and arrow is even incredibly useful for long distance sniper like shots. Plus the bow is your last cooldown item, it has infinite arrows but time is needed to replenish them, but this is good because you'll never find yourself out of ammunition in a squeeze. But the shotgun, the shotgun is epic in both double barrel and single forms, but its real power is with upgrades. If you collect and unlock the distance upgrade, it's incredible. It means you can fire at enemies miles away and the same force will be applied as if they were in close proximity. Now you might think that would make it overpowered, but it's not. It's just mighty useful and a lot of fun. But even so, there are still countless situations where other weapons are preferable, 
and picking an upgrade strategy is essential for beating certain enemies. This in itself adds a tactical depth to proceedings which I like. Every time you visit one of these upgrade statues you can reset all the slots and reconfigure your path so nothing is stuck. Although I should note that in the earlier version I played the upgrade loadout would kind of save itself when you change it, overwriting what you may have saved from a previous manual slot. So weapons and upgrades are fun, and with over 10 weapons available at the moment, you won't get bored. If I did have one desire on the weapons front, it would be a separate dedicated key to punch or kick, Duke Nukem style, so you could smash through boxes and the like without switching back to your katanas first. It's a small niggle, but I often just chose to use bullets rather than switch back and forth, which wasted precious ammo. Another small gripe is that sometimes small gaps don't allow your bullets to pass through, so you might feel you've got a clean line of sight, but there's an invisible wall that's blocking your path. Thankfully, this is an infrequent occurrence, only happened a couple of times to me. But other than that, by Jove, this is an incredibly fun experience that really plonks your feels in the years of past. Now, I should note that the title is currently in early access, but even so, the number of bugs I encountered were few and far between. At one point I got stuck in a wall in a secret area, which was a little disconcerting, but I have been playing with an earlier release than what will even be available to the public, and I've been told most issues have been fixed. In its current state, you get two campaigns, which on hard or hell mode will last you a good number of hours. It took me just under five hours to get through them in normal mode. If you're a much better player than me, you'll probably want to discover the hidden nightmare mode and dive straight in with that. But that is tough. I mean, it's really tough. Normal mode for me was the perfect difficulty level. Things were tough, but not too tough to get in the way of fun. Early access is priced at $14.99 with a 10% discount during the first week, with the final release set to sell for $19.99. Available through Steam, GOG, Epic, etc. The final version is planned to have five chapters due to be added throughout the next year. Now, you might recognize the title from an earlier iteration that was doing the rounds called Hell Hunt. Of course, it's now Dread Templar, which was down to a reported bogus USPTO filing last year. Unfortunately, out of T19 Games' hands. Regardless, this is T19's first release, so I caught up with Ting, the game's solo developer and person behind T19 Games, to ask a few questions, including what influence were drawn on, because clearly there's a heavy Quake vibe. Throughout the development process, new ideas were constantly being added to the Dread Templar. Quake 1 is my favourite so I used it as the main vibe and art style. Another one is Blood, which I actually didn't like when I was a kid. Even ranked it as one of my most hated first person shooters. But strangely enough, when I replayed Blood a few years ago, I was totally hooked. Compared to other boomer shooters, Blood's level design is particularly fascinating to me, and DT is really inspired by Blood in level design. Compared to Hell Hunt, DT has a weapon upgrade system and replaced the bullet time mechanic, which is inspired by action games including DMC, Bloodborne, etc. Personally, I find it incredible that any title like this can be created entirely by one person, and I thoroughly recommend it if you're seeking an old school shooter. Thanks again to 1C Entertainment for sponsoring and Ting for answering my questions. Until next time, I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo.